Welcome to Movie Insight Global, today I am going to explain a martial arts film called Fearless. Spoilers ahead. Watch and enjoy. Ten years old Hua Yuanjia is the son of a martial arts master named Hua Endi. Endi never allows Hua to take part in training, concerned about his asthma. The kid however has a passion for kung fu. He tries his best to sneak into his father's classes to learn the basics of it. Hua's only friend is a nerdy kid named Jin Sun. He does all of Hua's calligraphy homework, allowing him to train instead. Andy is the second best in martial arts in their town which is soon about to change because he has been challenged by the best, Zhao. Hua is excited about the fight and confident that the victory will fall to his father's lap. Andy has the upper hand in the match and is about to land a fatal blow on Zhao. But his beliefs in fair gameplay stop him from doing so. Taking advantage of his niceness, Zhao retaliates and wins the match dishonorably. Hua is heartbroken by the incident. Zhao's son challenges him to a fight when only the kids are together. Hua confidently takes up the challenge, but is defeated in no time. At this moment, he vows to restore his family's name and be the best martial artist in Tianjin. He and Jin Sun go to his father's library and steal his book about martial arts. Then, using the book, he trains day and night without rest. When Hua finally thinks he is ready, he challenges Zhao to a fight again. Zhao accepts the challenge confidently, but is instantly proven weak against a trained Hua. Several years later, Hua has grown up to become even better in martial arts. His father passed away long ago, along with his wife, who left him with a little daughter. Hua spoils her since she is his joy and pride in life. After his last fight with Zhao, Hua has remained undefeated. He has fought several opponents, but none of them were good enough to give him a hard time. Hua has also gathered a lot of fans and followers over the years. But along the way, he has developed pride and is starting to forget his father's principles. He drinks and parties all the time and lets his disciples focus on having fun more than practicing. Some days he drinks so much that he forgets to return home to his daughter. He has spent all of his family's money and has gone into debt but has no care in the world. One evening, he goes to his best friend Jin Sun who is now a wealthy businessman and the owner of a famous restaurant. As usual, Hua drinks till midnight and treats his followers to unlimited food. Jin Sun's assistant reminds him that Hua has not paid his bills for over a year which has been piling up. Later that night, Jin Sun tries putting some sense into Hua. Jin Sun knows that Hua's disciples only like him because he treats them to free food and drinks. He wants Hua to stay careful of his spending habits, but Hua thinks Jin Sun is just being stingy. The following day, he bumps into his biggest rival, Qin. He is the only man who hasn't fought with Hua yet. Since he has also defeated every opponent, Qin is considered the best in martial arts by many. They get into a slight altercation which hurts Hua's pride. He takes his anger out on his disciples, beating them up while they train. At night, one of his followers has to be brought to him in a stretcher. It turns out that Qin beat him up for some reason. Hua assumes that he did it out of spite and is filled with anger. In Jin Suan's restaurant, Qin and his family are celebrating his birthday. Suddenly, Hua barges in with his people and starts drinking at a nearby table. Qin asks him to keep their rivalry aside for the night because he doesn't want to fight. But Hua is in no mood to back down. Jin Sun also tries to stop him but is, in turn, insulted. In a fit of rage, he breaks up their lifelong friendship. Now even angrier, Hua challenges Qin to a fight and asks him to kneel down if he doesn't want to accept. Everyone gets out of the restaurant for their safety, leaving the fighters alone. They get into an intense battle, both matching in skill and strength. But when anger takes over Hua, he doesn't play fair. He beats Qin up till he is exhausted and lands a life-threatening punch on his chest. It causes him to die instantly. Hua returns home in the morning to see his mother's dead body on her bed. Qin's followers had killed her to take revenge on him. He cries, mourning her death before suddenly realizing his daughter is also in the house. Upon walking into her room, he is met with the biggest surprise of his life. She is lying on her bed, covered in blood. In her hand is a little pouch that she promised to give him when he returned home. Broken by the deaths he caused, Hua steps out of the house when his disciples inform him that the man who was beaten up by Qin had insulted his wife. Qin did not beat him out of spite, but for his wife's honor. Filled with guilt, regret, and sorrow, Hua doesn't see a reason for him to keep living. He boards the first ship and lies down in a corner, willing to go wherever it takes him. After living in the streets for six months, Hua has enough of life. 
He tries to commit the unthinkable, but is soon saved by a group of people by the river. They bring him to their tribe and take great care of him. But even after gaining consciousness, Hua goes into depression and doesn't talk to anyone. A blind woman named Moon takes care of him and is worried that he will never get up from the bed. Her experienced grandmother is confident that he will be fine with time. One day, Moon feels Hua's hair and offers to cut it. He walks for the first time in a month and goes to a river with her where she helps him cut his hair. Starting that day, he becomes a member of their community. He helps them cook, farm, and do household work. As a year passes, Moon and Hua start falling for each other. Then, one day, a kid from their tribe is found stealing a cow from a neighboring community. The grandmother and Moon beg for forgiveness from the rival leader. But according to their tradition, someone who makes a mistake should be beaten till an incense burns out. Hua speaks up for the tribe and offers to take the beating in the kid's place. For adults, the punishment is a bit different, which means Hua will have to fight against the leader. Although Hua can finish him in no time, he doesn't want to use his knowledge to hurt anyone anymore. Initially, he doesn't even defend himself, but after a little motivation from the grandmother, he starts to dodge the attacks. The incense burns off but the leader is not able to land a single blow on him. He accepts his defeat and praises Hua. The next day, Hua Moon and the children of the tribe are in the field. The children want to learn Kung Fu from Hua, but he refuses to teach them. He knows what great power does to people and wants the peaceful village to remain the same. The children also innocently mention that Hua and Moon are the closest to each other, but the adults ignore the comment. One day, Moon goes to see her parents' grave. This reminds Hua of his parents and daughter, who he abandoned after her death. Now that he is in a better mental condition, he wants to return home to visit their graves. He tells Moon about the plan and she happily encourages him. Hua promises to return as soon as he can and asks her to wait for him. In the following scene, we see him enter his hometown Tianjin, which is now an entirely different place. After the fall of the Qin dynasty, several strong nations attacked China and took it over. Tianjin became partially colonized, which caused several foreign residents to reside in the city and influence their culture. Hua goes to his childhood house, which is now an old shabby place. The family servant Laifu welcomes him in. He has tried his best to keep things as they were, but after Hua's departure, a bunch of creditors flipped the entire house to look for money. Hua goes to his family's grave and apologizes to his father. He finally understands why he didn't land the punch years ago when he could have won the title of the best player. After that, he goes to apologize to Qin's family and bows down in front of his shrine. As he wanders around the city, he sees that a wrestler named Hercules O'Brien is challenging Chinese people in a fight. He has remained undefeated in every fight and is confident of his next victory. To conserve Chinese heritage, Hua wants to challenge him, but he will need some money for it. For his next stop, he goes to Jin Suan's place and apologizes for what happened years ago. He promises to have learned from his actions. When Jin Sun finds out what he needs the money for, he doesn't waste time before handing it to him through an assistant. Then, in the 1909 race club, Shanghai, Hercules goes against Hua. At first glance, someone petite like Hua could never beat Hercules who is double his size. Before the match begins, Hua requests that he and Hercules fight with honor and civility. Taking advantage of the language barrier, the announcer mistranslates Hua's request and he wants to kick your butt, making Hercules laugh. The fight starts, and Hua instantly gains the upper hand. As the match gets intense, Hua saves the opponent from being impaled to nails on the side of the ring. As a good sportsman, Hercules accepts his defeat, making Hua the victor. Hua gains fame from the single fight and is called to Shanghai. He meets Jin Sun there, who proposes they form Chin Wu Athletic Association, a place where they teach Chinese students the art of Kung Fu. That way, even with the constant foreign pressure, they can preserve their heritage. Meanwhile, a group of officials from the foreign chamber is not fond of Hua's growing popularity among the Chinese public. They fear that his wins against the foreign fighters may trigger anti-foreign sentiments among the Chinese people. Hence, to make sure he loses in the ring the next time, they propose a match between Hua and four foreign champions consecutively in a single day. The Japanese representative, Mr. Mita, promises to end Hua once and for all this time. Even though the challenge is difficult and is obviously a tactic to make him lose, Hua agrees to take part. One day before the big fight, he meets his rival, the Japanese champion Tanaka. They talk over tea and befriend each other. Tanaka is a fair and respectable sportsman Hua, but unlike the people who are sponsoring him. Cut to the day of the fight. 
Ho is made to go against three fighters from around the world, but none of them last in the ring for more than two minutes. Hua manages to defeat all three without breaking a sweat. Lastly, he goes against Tanaka who apologizes for the unfair match and asks him if they should reschedule. Hua says it's fine and the first round starts. They fight using weapons of their choice, Hua uses a Sanji gun and Tanaka uses a katana. Amidst the intense battle, they accidentally exchange weapons. Tanaka is not very good at handling a Sanji gun so to make it a fair fight, Hu offers to exchange weapons. The first round ends in a draw because of the holdup. While resting before the next round, Hu drinks tea that is poisoned by Mr. Mita, who wants to see him lose one way or the other. The round starts but Hu collapses and starts coughing blood almost immediately. Tanaka demands that the match be halted for the safety of the fighter, but when Ho registers he has been poisoned, he wishes to continue as he is going to die anyway. Even when exhausted and seconds away from death, Ho manages to deliver a final blow to Tanaka's chest, using the same technique that killed Chin. However, he holds the punch back this time, learning from his mistakes. But just then, he collapses. Tanaka declares Hua the winner, knowing that he held back on the punch deliberately. In the end, Hua falls into his friend's arms and dies. Tanaka angrily belittles Mr. Mita for resorting to killing a man for his pride. He calls him a disgrace to Japan before storming off. In the last scene, Hua's spirit reaches the field outside Moon's house. She runs to him, sensing his presence even though she is blind. Thanks for watching. Please like, share and subscribe the channel.